Dear ladies and gentlemen, dearest colleagues, my name is Michael Kreuter from the Center for Rare and Interstitial Lung Diseases at the Torx Clinic at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And now it is my great pleasure to discuss with you the diagnosis and treatment of pro progressive fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. These are my disclosures. I would like to start with a patient of mine, a female patient, 71 years old, when we first met her. She complained a little bit of her exertion, no dyspnea and mild cough. We performed all the typical questionnaires. There were no exposures, no other complaints. Comorbidities included arterial hypertension and reflux disease. Lung function was still quite preserved with an FVC of 88% predicted and a diffusion capacity of 53%. We performed the typical setup, including BAL, which was uh, showing no lymphocyte and no eosinophilia. We did the autoantibody and HP screening, which were all negative. So let's have a look at the HRCT. So I go from apical to the more basal parts. And as you can see here, there's reticulation. There's a basal predominance, and there is some mild, but there is existing traction bronchiectasis. So we discussed this patient in our multidisciplinary team. HRCT was rated by a radiologist as early, but probably a P pattern. We discussed about taking a biopsy, however, that patient declined, and we thought, well, because of probably a P pattern, it is uh, not uh, indicated. We also excluded other courses. So my question to you would have been, so what would you say that patient is suffering from? What diagnosis would you make? Well, we discussed it in our ILD board and we came up with the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and IPF with preserved lung function. So the patient was complaining about symptoms, some dyspnea, some cough, so we recommended to initiate antifibrotic therapy at that time. However, after a couple of months, the patient wished to terminate the antifibrotic therapy due to side effects and a watch and wait strategy was supplied. Two years later, the patient started with complaints of joint pain and swelling, morning stiffness, and it was also an autoantibody screening performed again. Now the rheumatoid factor and the anti-CCP were significantly elevated. The GP sent the patient to the rheumatologist and he made the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So now my question to you would be, what would now be your diagnosis? Is it still IPF or is it rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD? Well, we revised the diagnosis from IPF to RAILD. But the main question is, what was the subsequent course of disease in that patient? And you can see here on the left side, that was when we met the patient first. And there was a decline from 88% predicted to 72% predicted at the time of the first identification of rheumatoid arthritis. So you see here a significant decline Immunomodulatory therapy was started. However, you see that all over the patient lost a lot of lung function uh, over the years. And you also can see that here in the CT scans, the initial CT, the follow-up CT at the time point of RA diagnosis. And you see here a progression of the fibrotic extent on HRCT. And now you see very clear honeycombing. So whatever that disease is, it has an IPF-like disease behavior. We do know about IPF that this is a progressive disease in almost all our patients. There could be slow progression and there can be rapid progression and something in between. But what do we know about other diseases? Do other fibrotic interstitial lung diseases also affect morbidity and mortality of our patients? Oh yes, they do. You see here three examples. On the left side, you see systemic sclerosis. In the middle, you see rheumatoid arthritis. And on the right side, you see hypersensitivity pneumonitis. What can we learn from these studies? 
in this study here, asking changes in course of death and systemic sclerosis, we had to learn that over the years, pulmonary fibrosis is now the course of death in patients in SSC. Looking at rheumatoid arthritis here, and very interesting and nice study coming from Denmark showing that a patient with R not suffering uh, from ILD has a much better survival than a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see here that after about 10 years, mortality is almost doubled if patients are suffering from ILD due to rheumatoid arthritis. What about this example here, hypersensitivity pulmonitis? Well, what you can see here is that we have an increase in mortality over the years. So there's threat by IPF, but there's also threat by other non-IPF for browsing interstitial lung diseases. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, is the pattern of fibrosis similar and different ILDs? Oh yes, that's what we do know. We have, for instance, UOP pattern and IPF and systemic diseases associated ILD, asbestos related ILDs, fibrosis, chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, and others. But the main question is, may the disease behavior similar? And there's a great learning from two studies which has been published previously. What our colleagues did here was they investigated the placebo arms of two studies. One study was the twin studies for an antenna lip and IPF in the impulses study. And that was compared to the placebo cohorts within the inbuilt studies. And these patients were analyzed for the annual rate of decline over the year and also for significant decline greater than 10% FEC and also rate of death. And what you can see here is the disease behavior. And I think this figure illustrates this very nicely. Disease behavior is very, very similar between IPF and patients who have a PF ILD phenotype, including that it has a high mortality rate of something between 5% in inbuilt and about 8% in impulses. I would like to introduce another patient to you to illustrate what PFILD may mean. That was a 76 years old male patient suffering from dyspnea on exertion six, six months and no cuff before we met him. There were again no exposures. However, there was one significant comorbid condition, meaning rheumatoid arthritis, which was diagnosed a year before, and he was formally treated with methotrexate and prednisolone. You can see here on the down, the lung function at baseline, if we see 75% predicted at baseline, diffusion capacity significantly impaired with 34% at baseline. And here you can see the baseline RCT, some traction bronchiectasis, uh, some reticulation and some ground water pacification. We did the regular workup and then came up with the interdisciplinary diagnosis of a rheumatoid arthritis interstitial lung disease. The patient was also discussed with a rheumatologist and he suggested to initiate a treatment of atherothyroprene and prednisolone because MTX was not tolerated anymore. So in the first follow-up after a year, you can see here lung function and diffusion capacity were stable. But another year later, meaning 24 months after baseline, we see a significant decrease in lung function of 5%. We had more symptoms. And also what you can see is an increase of the extent of fibrosis on HRCT. This is the baseline CT. This year is the 24 month CT. And you see here the increase of fibrosis with the UIP pattern in that patient. And this is what we call the phenotype of progressive pulmonary fibrosis, again, in a patient not suffering from IPF, but here from the systemic disease, rheumatoid arthritis. And we find it in many different forms of interstitial lung diseases, this phenotype. We may have it in pneumoconiosis, especially in asbestosis-related ILD. We have it in systemic diseases, here mainly systemic sclerosis associated ILD and rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD. We may have it in chronic fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis, very rarely also sarcoidosis, 
We find it very commonly in unclassifiable ILDs and in the fibrosing NISIP, the idiopathic form. So now the question is, what is PFILE? How shall we define it? And Martin Kolb has published a very nice overview about that. So what consists of disease progression? It means a decline in lung function and or an increase in the extent of radiological abnormality. Patients have a decrease in exercise capacity, but mainly these patients have more symptoms, worsening of cough and dyspnea, and by this, they have a deterioration health-related quality of life. And extremely important, the impression of us, of the treating physician, is that that patient's disease has worsened. And then there's another complication, which also comes for disease progression, which is acute exacerbation. And currently, there exists a couple of different uh, definitions. We have one from Ressan Cotin in a very nice review. We have a germ study, and we have the unclassifiable ILD study, and then we have the INVIL study. And more or less, all of these definitions include a decrease in lung function over time and or combined with worsening of respiratory symptoms or increased extent of fibrosis on HRCT or the combination of more symptoms and more fibrosis on HRCT. Does it make a difference which of the definitions we are using? Oh, yes, it does. This year's work retrospectively assessed in patients with ILD, with fibrotic ILD, looking at the different definitions. And you see here that the decline is different from uh, depending on from which definition you're using. However, acute exacerbations are very frequent and more frequent than in non-IPF and do not differ between the different definitions, very similar to hospitalizations and rate of death. So what could be a definition of PF in clinical practice? This here is an expert statement. However, we are still missing an internationally accepted definition. And in that expert statement published almost two years ago, we concluded that a progressive phenotype should be based on a relative decline in lung function despite treatment or a combination with a decline in diffusion capacity, or what has been said before, combination of lung function decline and either increased fibrosis and in HRCT or progressive symptoms, or again, the combination of increased fibrosis and more symptoms. How prevalent is PFRID? This here is a very nice review by Marlies Weisenberg and Rasson Cotin. And in this figure you see here, these are the different interstitial lung diseases. And in the inner circle, you see here how often, at least from the literature, uh, the PFILD phenotype occurs. So just to give you an example, about 20% of our patients with ILD are suffering from a systemic disease. And about 24% of these have a PFILD phenotype. And this is very different between the different forms of systemic diseases. For instance, in rheumatoid arthritis, once these patients develop a interstitial lung disease, almost 40% of these patients have a progressive fibrosin phenotype. What have we learned recently about PFRLD? This here is very nice work from a French cohort published by the group from Versailles Cotin. So what they did is they looked into their patients and identified out of their patient 670 with fibrosing ILD other than IPF or CPFE. And about a fourth of these patients had a progressive fibrosin phenotype. Well, there's perhaps a little bit of a bias in here because he's seeing a lot of patients with autoimmune ILD. So this is why this number here is very high. However, what the colleagues here very nicely described is factors associated with mortality. It is mainly patients who are more uh, advanced in their disease, who are older, and then have a more significant decline in lung function, and especially in diseases, and this is what you can see here, disease subtypes, especially the subtype of unclassifiable ILD, is significantly associated with disease progression, also for hypersensitivity pulmonitis or idiopathic NSIP. However, Versailles and his co-workers also looked into the French healthcare database 
because they wanted to know how frequently are these patients hospitalized. And you can see here that hospitalization is extremely common in patients with PFILD. And also you see here many of these are, have to be admitted to intensive care unit. And moreover, the costs for these patients with PFILD is extremely high. Can we predict how the further course of PFID is? Well, there might be other learnings from IPF. On the left side, you see here biomarkers for IPF. We do not have good biomarkers yet for PFID, but one could be a very simple one, which is monocytes. These monocytes here as disease progression markers in IPF have been published recently. And you can see here that elevated monocytes are associated either with, with IPF progression or all cross hospitalization and also with mortality. But what about monocytes as biomarkers for PFILD? This here is data which we presented at the latest ERS meeting. And you can see here very similar. We looked at elevated monocyte counts in these patients from the inbuilt trial. And we have shown that an elevated monocyte count is associated with more death and acute exacerbation of ILD or death. So again, we may have here a disease progression parameter, which we now have to analyze in further studies. Well, once PFILD is established, what shall we do? What kind of therapies may we apply? This here is a very nice survey we performed some years ago. And what you can see here is what I call a confusogram because it's very colorful and it shows you that everybody's using different. What do I mean by this? So we have here different diseases and you have here different treatments, first, second, and third line. And you can see here that once disease progression occurs in many of the diseases, we are using steroids, but we're using everything else. And there is no clear guidance in this, and, uh, we are, or we were lacking clear guidance. One of the guidance came at least for systemic diseases. And this here is a very nice review already in 2012, in times when antifibrotic therapy was not yet available. And that was being published by a rheumatologist and a pulmonologist. And they said, once we have ILD, and we have a definite systemic disease and thus CTD ILD, we should consider whether this is clinically significant and then consider immunosuppressive therapy. And some of the drugs we have are on this list here. However, until recently, we had two different forms of treatment, antifibrotic drugs only for IPF and for other fibrosing ILDs, we were only using immunosuppression. But already in 2012, these two, the rheumatologist and the pulmonologist asked, once we have CTD ILD, however it behaves like IPF, why shouldn't we think about treatment as IPF? And this led to three studies. The inbuilt study, the study investigating the use of nintendonib in patients with PF ILD, and the definitions were, as I discussed with you before, lung functional decline or a combination with HRCT and or worsening of symptoms. And we had two other studies, one from the German Center for Lung Research, the relief study where the Fenderden was investigated over a year, and then the unclassifiable progressive fibrosis ILD study, again, where the Fenderden was investigated. And the included patient populations differed. Somehow you can see here that the most broadest uh, patient population included was the inbuilt study. It included fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, different form of systemic disease associated ILDs, idiopathic NSIP, and also other exposures, including also fibrotic progressive sarcoidosis. The relief study more or less very similarly, however, not all of these systemic diseases and the unclassifiable, only patients with unclassifiable progressive um, IILDs 
And some of these patients also had an IPAD phenotype. So what were the outcomes? First of all, the inbuilt study. The inbuilt study showed that once patients were treated with an attendant compared to placebo, had a significant less decline in lung function. And if you look at these values, they are very similar to what we have seen in the twin impulses trials for IPF. A difference of more than 100 milliliters per year and a relative reduction of more than 55%. But it was not only this, there was also more, a very other important secondary endpoint that was uh, either exacerbation of ILD or death. And you can see here that the est capital Meyer estimates of first acute exacerbation of ILD or death also favored the treatment with the antifibrotic treatment, as you can see here. One of the questions I'm always asked is, is this treatment effect sustainable? And for this ongoing studies investigating patients, either continuing the drug or switching from placebo to the drug are going on. And this here is the so-called inbuilt on study. And here you can see that in that extension study, lung function wise, these patients remain are under the drug and show still efficacy very similar to what we have seen in the inbuilt study. And also the adverse events profile is similar to the inbuilt study. So effects are sustainable. And then we have the Durham Center for Lung Research study, the relief study, the study which had a lot of problems. So there was under recruitment and due to the assumption that futility uh, was present, uh, the study had to be stopped. However, at the final expiration of the study, you can see here and here that also there were significant effects for the patients treating with antifibrotic drugs in PFILD. And very similarly, that is the study for unclassifiable ILD. The primary endpoint, the use of home spirometry, was negative because there were many technical issues. However, the typical study are endpoints where a site spirometer was used was positive, also demonstrating an effect of this drug. However, we have to be careful. Not all patients with an increase of symptoms and fibrosing ILD and a decline in lung function may have PF ILD. And for this, I brought finally three patients with me. A 70 years old female patient. And you can see here that after 1.5 years, there was a significant decrease in lung function. The second patient, 64, 64 years old patient, also had a significant decline in lung function over two years. And very similarly, the third 73 years old female patient had a very significant decline over one year. However, this patient had a true PFILD. That was a patient with unclassifiable ILD. You can see here the increase of fibrosis in the HRCT. However, the second patient was a bird breeder. And that patient was again exposed to birds. And what you can see in the CT is you have an increase of ground glass opacifications. So that was not PFILD. That was, again, antigen exposure. So antigen eviction was here the right therapy. And that was not PFILD, that was alveolitis. And the third patient was a patient with systemic sclerosis. And you can see here, there was some mild reticulation at baseline. And then the patient had aggravated symptoms and even a loss in lung function. However, on HRCT, it was stable. There was only a minor component of fibrotic extent of fibrosis. And the reason why that patient had more symptoms was because the patient had developed pulmonary hypertension. So we have to rule out other reasons for increasing dyspnea. How should we approach patients with ILD or PFILD? There's two great and already reference to that. Uh, papers being published recently, one by Melise Weissenbeck and one by Peter George and co-workers. So first of all, we have to identify the underlying ILD. We have then to consider the appropriate treatment. And once we then see that these patients have a disease progression, 
then we should consider antiferropartic agents as also in this schedule by Peter George and colleagues. So in order to conclude, we have different forms of fibrosin ILEs, and in a subset of these patients, a phenotype of progressive fibrosing ILEs develops. However, PFILD is not a disease, it is a phenotype. There are still a couple of open questions, especially treatment algorithms and furthermore, an internationally accepted definition of PFILD is something we definitely need urgently. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and looking forward to the discussions.